Revelation, the first thing that you want to understand concerning that book is that it is a book of end times and prophecy. Because if you look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, if you look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, that it is a book about prophecy and end times where God has to show things to John where it will come to pass. A lot of people, the mistake that they do with Revelation, which you have to watch out for, is that when it comes to prophecy, they put that and limit it to a first century. So, what they're going to teach concerning about preterism or preterism, however way you want to pronounce that, preterism, preterism, they believe that basically the prophecies in Revelation has already been fulfilled at the first century, which is totally false. So a lot of the passages that they'll be reading from Revelation, they will make it figurative or metaphorical. When they make it figurative and metaphorical, the only reason why they do that is because they can't take it literally as it says. So the Bible, you have to take it literally as it says. That's where we come with not the preterist approach, but a dispensational approach. What is the dispensational approach? Dispensation or dispensationalism, what we believe is that we take the historic grammatic context. What is a historic grammatic context? We look at not just the history, the background of Revelation, but we take the grammatical context, we take the words literally as it says. So it's basically, the difference is it's a literal approach. Whereas this one is a metaphorical approach. What's the problem with the metaphorical approach? The problem with the metaphorical approach is that anyone can make up any interpretation then. And you support the liberals' argument that the Bible can be interpreted in ten different ways. And not only that, it is so many people have different interpretations of the Bible. You can't tell what's what unless you take literally as the word says. See, if you literally take as the word says, then there's no way around the interpretation. That's the reason why we go by the literal approach. I mean, isn't that common sense anyway? Isn't it common sense that when you hear a certain word from somebody, the first thing you react is a literal? Or is it metaphorical? What if your son smart mouths you? You know, you say, go wash the dishes, and then your son smart mouths to you. Well, what does that really mean? What you meant, <laughs> what you meant was, let's play video games. Let's play video games. That's what you meant. You know, you, you feel like slapping the kid after that, right? Yeah. So... You'll notice right here that, see, that's why it's common sense to do a literal approach. So it is not metaphorical unless what? Unless the text, the verse, shows you it's metaphorical. Right. See, when you take the verse literally as it says, you're going to find other verses where it can literally show you by context that this is going to be a metaphorical approach. So that's why I take the verse as literally as possible. That's Revelation. So, because there are so many things in Revelation that obviously did not happen at the first century, they have to be sometime at the future. That's what we believe in. So that's why we believe in a dispensational approach where it has to happen sometime at the future. It did not all happen at the first century, obviously. You might say, why is that, Pastor? Well, for example, if you read Revelation chapter 22, that did not happen yet, where we have a new heaven and a new earth. Yeah. Now, unless you want to, so we're still at the same old dumb old earth, amen? The same old corrupted universe. Yeah. Now, unless that you want to metaphorically interpret that, then you, be my guest and do it. Do whatever you want. <laughs> but man, it's going to be a crazy interpretation, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> All right, now, Revelation, that's the introduction that you must understand. If you have that kind of mindset, then the rest is going to make sense. All right, one thing concerning about Revelation is that it starts out with the introduction at Revelation chapter 1. 
So Revelation chapter 1 is an introduction. You're going to notice that verses 1 through 3, he expl uh, which we already covered in Revelation 1, 1, it's a book of prophecy. So already the literal interpretation is laid out. If you look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 3 especially, it told you that you got to keep the words. So it shows you how much a literal approach is necessary. Mm, that's good. So Revelation 1, 1 through 3 is a great way that it shows you where, how to begin your study. And then the re remaining part of Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, he introduces the seven churches and the seven spirits. And then verse 5, he introduces Jesus Christ. You'll notice that verses 5 all the way to verse 20 is about Jesus Christ. So Revelation chapter 1 will be introducing mainly the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords on who Jesus Christ is. Amen. Amen. You'll notice in Revelation chapter 1 concerning about Jesus Christ, he is not some effe effeminate sissy, blonde hair and blue eyes, nor is he according to the black Hebrew Israelites where he's black. And they try to use Revelation chapter 1 verse 15 because he's burnt in a furnace that he's black <laughs> they don't realize that they themselves interpreting that way does sound racist anyways so for those people to accuse us of being racist they don't realize that by interpreting that way they're being racist themselves okay but anyways if you look at verses uh, 5 all the way through 20 it is about Jesus Christ he is what awesomeness yeah. fearful majestic You'll see that, for an example, at verse 11, he is Alpha and Omega. Verse 14, head and hairs white like wool, eyes flame as fire. You'll notice verse 16, in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. That don't sound like the, the <laughs> d uh, sissified Jesus, does it? No. no, it's Jesus in his power majestic form. Amen. So it gives the right image of Jesus Christ. Amen. And then Jesus Christ... He's the main picture, but then it mentions seven stars and seven churches. You'll notice that what the seven stars and seven churches are, it also mentions about the seven candlesticks. Now you'll notice right here, why is it that it's talking about seven stars, seven candlesticks, seven churches? Because he already told you at verse 20. Notice that the metaphorical part, seven stars, candlesticks, etc., is literally interpreted to you. See? So it's going to explain if it's going to be metaphorical or not. That's why it's important to have a literal approach first. Yeah, that's good. So notice it explains to you literally the metaphorical interpretation. Verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Well, there you go. See that? So there we already have our answer. So the angels are referring to this, and the churches are referring to this. Now, Revelation chapter 2 through 3 is probably, in my opinion the most applicable chapter to you that you should know. It is referring, we see right here, the church age. And that covers in Revelation chapter 2. So Revelation chapter 1 gives an introduction of Jesus Christ and then it's talking about the future. So it talks about the future of the church, and the seven churches are mentioned at Revelation chapter 2 through 3. And I don't know if your memory is good, but let's put it down together, all right? You can say it out loud with me. Ephesus is one. What's the second one? Can you guess? Smyrna. All right, what's the third one? Can we guess? Pergamus. There we go. What's the fourth one? Thyatira. Okay, that's good. All right. What's the fifth one? Yes. Sardis. Sardis? All right. What's the sixth one? 
Philadelphia. Philadelphia. We all know that one. Yeah. Philadelphia. Yeah. And then the last one, you all don't know this last one. <laughs> we all know this one because we hate this the most, right? I'll put this in all caps. Laodicea. Uh, is it cut off? I hope no, I'm not good. cut off. All right. So these are the seven churches. All right. Now, if we cover these seven uh, churches in the church age timeline, what do we see the Christian application in the church age timeline? So we're going back 2,000 years of history from today to back there. So Ephesus, the timeline that it covers, let's see right here. Uh, the timeline that it would cover in the book of, uh, not the book of Ephesus, the church of Ephesus would be the first century. So we see that as the first century with Ephesus. So it will cover the first century timeline. I don't know this from memory, so I'm just going to have to do the best I can. It's a first century timeline concerning about Ephesus. Smyrna will cover the time period of the ten persecutions where the Roman, where the Roman uh, system, pagan Rome, persecuted the Christians mercilessly. I mean, it was pretty brutal. So it will cover the ten persecutions of Rome. Yeah, this is going to be kind of cramped. So I'll do the best I can to make it legible. All right. Ten Roman persecutions. That's the timeline. The timeline of Pergamus was when pagan Rome combined with the Christian church. And Catholicism was taking birth. So Constantine. Constantine was practically the last Roman emperor and the first Roman pope. Pagan Rome transitioned to the Catholic Church. So Pergamus was that time when it was full of compromising. Thyatira was the time of great darkness. We see the dark ages during that timeline. That was where tremendous persecution was spreading out all over. And not only that, the Catholic Church was conquering uh, empire, nation after nation, the, the Crusades, and etc. There was so much blood. And there were so many people in darkness that time, Thyatira. During the time of Sardis, it also completely continued in spiritual darkness. And that was when the Reformation was spreading that time as well. The Reformation. The Reformation during that time, even though that it was exposing the errors of the Catholic Church, these people, they had a problem where they weren't being evangelistic. It wasn't spreading out missions. That's where Calvinism was bo born that time, actually, as well. That's why Calvinism is a dead system. All they do is sit down and just study books. That's it. Philadelphia was a time of the Great Awakening revivals. And then Laodicea is our modern century today. Where it's not dead, where it's not on fire, it's lukewarm. So we live in a day and age where, and don't deny it, you're that type of Christian, the churches today, they're lukewarm. They love Jesus. Yeah. They're doing something for Jesus, but they're wrong in doctrine. Their practice is worldly. See? There's a dead and hot, uh, there's a cold and hot side. People think that a church is wrong when you see uh, problems with it, when a person doesn't love Jesus, when the person is wicked. No, that's not what makes a wrong church. A wrong church is a church that, uh, that loves Jesus, that loves one another, that defends the fundamentals of the faith, the hot combined with the cold, wrong doctrine, worldly practice, etc. See that? So people got to understand that's Laodicea. All right. So we see seven churches here. Now, things to understand concerning about Revelation chapter 2 is that these three timelines, like I mentioned to you before, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, they can be a little different because Larkin and Dr. Upman give separate timelines on this. The Reformation can jump to Philadelphia, for example, 
and the Dark Ages can jump over here to Sardis, whereas over here would be like a pre-medieval timeline, actually. So remember that Larkin and Ruckman, they can switch timelines with these three churches. But to be quite honest, it doesn't ma matter if you go by Larkin or Ruckman. It's pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much the same. Okay, another thing to understand concerning about Revelation chapter 2 through 3 is that it's not completely a church age doctrine. You cannot do that. Yeah. You got to realize that this one, uh, the book of Revelation is about what? Future end times prophecy. Yeah. So it will contain tribulation doctrine. So it is important where the book of Revelation that you have a double application approach. That is important to understand. Double application is absolutely... Now, this is good advice. If you don't know this, then you're going to mess up Revelation. You have to have double application when it comes to prophecy. For ex uh, You might say, I don't believe it. No, you do believe it. For example, the book of Psalms, it mentions at the book of Psalms where King David talks about, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That verse... We all know it is a prophecy, Old Testament prophecy, about the Messiah, Jesus, where he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But if you keep reading that chapter in the book of Psalms, the psalmist talks about forgiving me of my sins and iniquities. Well, that's not the Messiah, Jesus Christ. What happened? It's a double application. It's about King David, and it's about Jesus. So you have to, why? Because it's a prophetic book. Psalms is a prophetic book. You have to do the same thing. Look, Revelation is a no-brainer. It's a prophetic book. Then you definitely have to do double application. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So That's not good. only will it talk about to these churches, yeah. but it will also talk about, it will jump to the future timeline, the tribulation. Yeah. So when you read Revelation 2 and 3, some verses you can apply to the church, other verses have to be tribulation. Or one verse could be both a church age or a tribulation. Yeah. So you have to keep that in mind. It's a double application. If you do that, it's going to be a wealth of information and eye-opening. Okay, now Revelation chapter 4 is, you'll notice at verse 1, he starts to begin future prophecy right over here. So he begins talking about the future. So the fourth point over here is going to cover the rapture to heaven. That will be found in Revelation chapter 4 through 5. Uh, let's see. Let me know if I'm out of bounds, okay? So chapter 4 through 5 is going to cover... The church being raptured up to heaven and then tells you about all the things that happen in heaven. Now, to make a long story short, if you read verses 1 through 2, you'll see that the church is raptured up to heaven. There's a group out there that teaches that the church will go through the tribulation rather than being raptured before the tribulation. That is heresy that you have to watch out for. Amen. So, the pre-tribulation rapture, I'm not sure if you heard that before. So, pre-tribulation rapture, what does that mean? It simply means, pre means before the what? Tribulation. Amen. See that? There are other groups who are known as post-tribulation rapture so they believe the rapture is after the tribulation no you're going to notice that revelation chapter 4 through 5 especially 1 through 2 john experienced the rapture of the christians up to heaven and you'll notice that at verse uh, 10 through 11 the church is already up in heaven see that now, I'm not going to go through the specifics of these verses and argue. If you want to see my specifics in arguing on that one, look at my verse-by-verse -verse study on Revelation. And then I'll 
definitely prove that Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 through 2 has to be a pre-tribulation rapture that's different from a post-tribulation rapture. And that verses 10 through 11, those 24 elders, is referring undoubtedly to Christians who are up in heaven. So you can look at that one on the videos, okay? But that's what we see. They believe there's a rapture after the tribulation. Now, this, there are three other views that you should know about eschatology. So, meaning study of end times. But forget what I just said right there, okay? Premillennial. Premillennial believe that what's going to happen? We believe that before the millennium, that Jesus Christ has to come down and set up his kingdom on the earth, set up his millennium. Mm -hmm. That Jesus has to come down before his millennium kingdom. That's why we believe pre-tribulation rapture. Amen. All right, the post-millennial, they believe that concerning about the kingdom, that they can bring the millennial kingdom themselves. And then because they can bring the millennial kingdom to themselves, then Jesus Christ will say, what a great job, and come afterwards. Now that is blatant just cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, okay? No one believes in that, all right? You think this is the millennial kingdom we're living in? Come on. No, this is not a millennial kingdom. If you tell me we're living in the millennium, you don't know what you're talking about, okay? Here's the craziest one. Now, a millennial. Okay, so what is a millennial? So a millennial is that basically... <laughs> so this is kind of hilarious. Okay, so then post-millennial believes that they have to build up the millennial kingdom, and then Jesus Christ will eventually come down. They believe the millennium is already occurring. Okay, yeah. Yeah. so they believe the millennium is okay. So then during the dark ages, you're saying that the Catholic Church that they were building up the millennial kingdom then, right? So there is a justification then in conquering nations, shedding blood, right? Yeah. See, no, God don't believe in that. God believes that he has to set up his kingdom. Now, there's a, uh, another branch of our millennials where they believe that the millennial kingdom is already occurring, but not on earth. It's up in heaven. So it's going on up in heaven right now. So, <laughs> so then when will Jesus Christ set up his kingdom then on the earth? That's something that you got to ask yourself. So then these are three heresies that you got to watch out for. We believe we're raptured before the tribulation and Christ is going to have to come down and set up the millennial kingdom afterwards. Yeah. So that's what that's why we're pre-millennial and that's why we're pre-tribulation rapture. You'll notice at chapter 5 that there's a scenery in heaven where the Christians worship Jesus Christ and he's about to open the seal of the tribulation. Now, chapter 6, that's where we get to the interesting stuff. So then you'll see right here from chapter 6. And you'll also notice chapter 8. So we'll go from chapter 6 through 8. It is important to understand that revelation, that you cannot go in chronological order. That is important to know. If you go in chronological order, then you are not going to understand what's going on. Because what we see right here now is the tribulation. The tribulation. The tribulation that will cover from chapters 6 all the way to chapter 19. And that's the big stuff that a lot of people want to know the most out of Revelation. It's chapter 6 through 19. Because that's where all the action is. The majority of the book of Revelation talks about the tribulation timeline. Why? Because it's about end times. That's why. So you'll notice that chapter 6 talks about the six seals. Within these six seals, you'll see, uh, you'll see death, famine, the Antichrist coming out, World War III, nations turning against each other, and the saints being persecuted and chaos in the heavens. You'll also notice that the seventh trumpet, uh, the seventh seal, excuse me, the seventh seal is opened up at chapter eight. So you'll notice that the seventh seal is opened up at chapter eight and verse one. Within this seventh seal, you'll notice that it'll consist of the seven trumpets. 
And then what's going to be pretty interesting is that when you do honestly read every seal and every trumpet, there is no way that you can put the seven trumpets after the six seals. There's an interchangeable thing going on. You might say, why is that? Because a lot of the trumpets match with the seals. And not only that, the trumpets, what you're going to find out is that it consists of a long length of time as well. Yeah. For example, if you look at chapter 9, and then you read, verses, uh, you read verse 5, five months is going on over there. So you can't just cram it all in. You just can't cram it all in. In the sixth seal, the number six seal, Jesus Christ is about to come. And there's chaos in the heavens. And then all of a sudden, it, you got seven trumpets. And then like when you get the fifth trumpet, five months path. See? Doesn't make sense. Right when Jesus is about to come at seal number six, then seal number seven, all of a sudden, seven trumpets and five months. See? Doesn't make sense. So they have to be interchangeable. See? So... They happen, some of them happen at the same time, some of them uh, happen a little later on, but you can't go in chronological order with this. There's no way you can do that. All right, in the seven trumpets, it has the judgments. It has hail, blood, water turned to blood. You get mutants coming, popping out of hell and tormenting people. Devils uh, taking over people. So it's a nightmare. So that's what you see with the seven trumpets. Now... You're going to see the good guys at play within the tribulation. So at chapter 7, you see Jews and Gentiles who are tribulation saints. So chapter 7 talks about the good guys. Whereas chapter 6 through 9, we already see all the judgments going on right over here, right? So then we see from chapter 6 through 9, all these judgments occurring. And then this one is chapter 7. Then you'll notice that at chapter 7, another part of the good guys is the 144,000 Jews. These are virgin males. You're also going to notice chapter 11. So this is found at chapter 7. And then you see the two witnesses, which is found at chapter 11. Then another part of the good guys that you see is you're going to see the appearance of Jesus. Or a hero. You might say, wow, really? Yeah, so there is some kind of Hero, Obadiah mentioned at the last, uh, the la one of the last verses at Obadiah, the saviors, plural, little saviors are coming down. So there is such a thing as a hero or a savior that's going to show up. And this is very possible when you look at chapter 10 and chapter 12. So that's why it makes so much sense that there's going to be... Uh, a whole nation of Israel. It's going to be a nation, national salvation, a nationwide salvation of Israel converted. And Jews are the hardest people to reach, so that's hard to believe. The reason why it's hard to believe is because Satan knows that their salvation is prophesied, which is why he's making them the hardest to get saved today. That makes so much more sense now. Yeah, wow. See? Why? Because the Bible prophesied about their national salvation. So that just proves Scripture even more, not doubt Scripture. Uh, why will these hard-hearted Jews get saved? Because look at this. They get the appearance of Jesus or a hero that shows up. Two witnesses, and they go by the law of Moses. So Moses show up. Elijah does the miracles. And 144,000 virgin Jews that are sealed by God. So that's going to be, uh, so that is going to be convincing enough. And then the Gentiles also partake in the salvation. So we see the judgments. We see the good guys. And then also, what you're going to notice is that chapter, and i got to erase this, okay? Because we got to come down to the other points over here in the tribulation. You're also going to notice that at chapter 12, 
12 is going to consist of Israel's persecution and running away. This can, a lot of it is very similar to the book of Daniel, as well as Matthew 24. So you can see a lot of similarity with the book of Daniel, chapter 9, and Matthew 24, with Revelation chapter 12. Israel runs away from the Antichrist. Why? Because the Antichrist betrays the Jewish nation, and then he persecutes them. So obviously, that makes a lot more sense as well why a lot of Jews will get saved. Why? Because they're finally at that point where they're seeking help. Wow. And the world is turning against them. The Antichrist in the world is turning against them. So that's why they'll easily get saved. It makes a lot more sense now. So that's what we find at chapter 12. Satan is persecuting the nation of Israel. Then what you see... Chapter 13, and 13, throughout, you know that's a, not a good number in your Bible. It's like the epitome of evil, where we hear unlucky 13 as well. So we see the epitome of evil, where you see the Antichrist. You'll notice that his birth place is mentioned at verse 1, where he's coming out of the, uh, is it verse 1? Yeah, so it's at verse 1. And then you'll notice that, if you look at Daniel chapter 11, the evidence is built up even further. So he comes from the Mediterranean region. Why? Because he's close where Syria and Israel is. Because what we do know is that he is going to be Jewish. He is going to be Jewish. So we see his birthplace. We see at verse 2, he consists of the power. So he consists of the power where he's going to speak in English, mouth of a lion, you see also that his feet is the bear, so there is Russia. So why? Because America is heading towards socialism more and more and more. And then the leopard, which is the United States of America. So I'm not going to explain every detail why. You can watch my video, Seven-Headed Dragon and Ten-Horned Antichrist. That one, trust me, it's worth your time. You'll enjoy that. Seven-Headed Dragon and Ten-Horned Antichrist. In that video, I go through every reason why uh, these parts, these animal parts, would match with these nations. So I'm not going to explain that. So we know that the Antichrist, that he's going to have mainly connections with the United States, but his ethnicity is going to be Syrian Jew, and the religious church that's going to support him is Catholicism. So that's the reason why a lot of people say, wait, wait, pastor, I thought you said he's a Syrian Jew. I thought that, why do you say he's American? Or, you know, they get so confused. But I already gave the answer right here. His main connection that he's going to work with is the United States of America. His religion is going to be Roman Catholic, which is why it's going, it's going to be a pope. And his ethnicity is Syrian Jew. And that's easy to find because everyone's intermingling, okay? So this is a no-brainer right over here. He speaks in, uh, he's going to join the powers of the USA where he's going to speak in English and move like socialism over here. A lot of people, they'll say, well, Pastor Russia is no longer communist. Well, look, don't say that, okay, then? I know that it's not the Soviet Union anymore, but good night, nurse. Aren't you looking at current events, man? Wow. Yeah, just look at current events. It's practical, okay? It may not be officially known as communism, but it's moving like it. And the Bible talks about moving feet as a bear. It didn't say the system is. It says it's moving like it. See, the feet of a bear, it's moving like communism. Okay. Now, it also talks about the mark of the beast, which the infamous mark of the beast, which is found at verses 16 through 18. So his mark. Now, you'll notice it says mark, right? His animal body is what? A leopard. Which is why it can be like a, uh, you ever seen a leopard spot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a leopard spot, it's like a kiss. Now this is where we can get deep right over here. Why did the book of Psalms chapter 2, why did it say kiss the son lest he be angry? After the tribulation is over, he does that. Look at the leopard spot. 
It looks like a kiss mark. How about that, right? Here's another thing. You'll notice that it says mark, name, and number at verse 17. So what's important to understand, a lot of people are, uh, they deny that the mark of the beast can be some kind of computerized chip system. But no, that's very easy to believe because it's not just a mark. It's a name and the number of his name. Now, what's very interesting is that a lot of people talk about that when you look at that barcode when we buy items, that that matches up with actually 666, which is pretty interesting. Another thing is that what religion puts a spot, a mark, on your forehead? Roman Catholics. Look at the Eastern religions too. Why would they put that over there as well, right? Where you can attain that third eye. Look at that. This is very universal toward all religions and systems, our economics. So the Antichrist is going to do that. All right, there, there's your meat right there, all right? <laughs> Chapter 14. What happens is that we see that the 144,000, that they do go up to heaven, and God gives a warning to the people on the earth about the time of the end is coming closer. Chapter 15, they're up in heaven, the 144,000. And then chapter 16, God sends down his judgment. So you notice this is very similar with chapter 4 to 5, right? The church age saints are up in heaven. God warns the earth and sends down judgment. Here, you see tribulation saints raptured up to heaven. And then God sends down his judgment. Wait, did I hear that right, Pastor? So then there's two raptures you're saying. Absolutely. So there's a post-tribulation rapture for tribulation saints. And there is a pre-tribulation rapture for Christian saints. Amen. So that's what we see. Amen. So God gives a rapture to heaven. He gives a warning to the earth. And then sends down his judgments as well. Now, chapter 17 through 18, we'll talk about, you'll notice, a great poor who's in control over a lot of the kings of the earth. At chapter 17 through 18, you'll notice that she has a history, not just the future timeline. It's a history of martyrs from the beginning of the church age all the way to now. So think about one religious system of Babylon. That would definitely do that from the past 2,000 years of church history and the tribulation. There's only one system you can think of that is religious and that has to be state. That is the Roman Catholic Church. That is the only thing that you can think of. The Roman Catholic Church is the one that goes from the beginning of history to the end of the tribulation. That fits the bill perfectly. You'll notice that she's in charge over the kings of the earth, which makes it interesting where you get into conspiracies and the elite system. That means they all have a mother. That's her. You study some conspiracies, which is interesting. Some of these elites turn against their mother. Why is that? That's history, and that's proven at chapter 18. Those elites turn against the Roman Catholic Church and burn their mother. So it makes a lot of sense then. Makes a lot of sense. Very interesting when you study the conspiracies of the Rothschilds and then the Illuminati when it was born. It was the Jesuit general who um, had them meet together. And then uh, uh, they did it at a university at, uh, uh, what was that, in Ingolstadt. And I forgot the, the location. I, I usually remember that. But I think it's Bavaria. But over there in the university over there, that's where they found a Scottish Rite Freemasonry and a Jesuit wrote down the Masonic Oath over there. Which is why it's very interesting, the Masonic Oath, when you read it, it's very similar with the Jesuit Oaths as well. About cutting the throat ear to ear and then burning, flaying, drowning, etc., etc. A lot of the wordings are similar. Why? Because they have the same mother. All right. The Roman Catholic Church, it rises, but it also falls as well. It rises and falls. 
So it reigns supreme during the tribulation, but it's time of the end comes. Chapter 19, you'll notice Armageddon and the marriage supper of the Lamb. So you'll notice right here that all, that all the saints, tribulation, church age, Old Testament, etc., they're all up there at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then you'll notice right here the friends of the bridegroom, John the Baptist, You'll notice the church age Christians, which is the bride of Jesus, and then the tribulation saints, which are the bridesmaids. And then you'll see the husband, Jesus Christ. After we go up there in heaven with the marriage supper of the Lamb, we all, uh, you know where, what our honeymoon is? Our honeymoon is when we go down at Armageddon. Amen. And when we go down at Armageddon, we wipe out all of the wicked, th this wicked world that you're sick and tired of. And Jesus Christ finally wipes them all out. And then we have a honeymoon of 1,000 years at the millennium. Amen. All right, then. So that's chapter 20. Chapter 20, you see right here, the millennium. Satan is bound for 1,000 years. You'll find out at chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. And then you'll notice at verse 4 that the tribulation saints, they get to join the millennial rule with Jesus Christ. Then at verse 7, you'll notice that from verses 1 through 6 is the hap is our 1,000 year honeymoon with Jesus Christ. I think that's a really great honeymoon. Yeah, amen. All right then. And then after the honeymoon is over, Satan gets loose. And then comes out World War 4 or 5. Uh, World War 4 or 5. You might say, really? Yeah, because Satan, he gets loosed out of his prison, gathers all the world up together to, to fight against Jesus Christ. And obviously they lose. There's no way they can do that. Okay, in case some of you are wondering why I say four or five, is that because Armageddon, that's going to be number four or three. Why? Because there might be a World War III here. In the second seal, there are nations turning against each other. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't want to count that one, some Bible believers don't count that one, which is fine, then this one will be World War III then, Armageddon, and the World War IV would be after the millennium with yeah. Satan. But you see that there's going to be four or five world wars. So you know what that means? World War II is not the end. There's going to be two to three more world wars. That's something, that's something big right there. All right, and then the next part after that, after World War IV or V, then there's the Great White Throne Judgment. The Great White Throne Judgment is where all your lost loved ones and family members are judged by God. And as they're judged by God, God proves to them that they are guilty in their sin and that they do deserve hell, and he casts them into the lake of fire. Wow. Why would God do that? Because God put up yeah. with your foolishness for 2,000 years. Amen. He showed you enough grace and mercy. Now it's finally time for him to prove to you that because you kept rejecting his grace and mercy, that mm -hmm. you deserve to burn in hell forever for your sin. That's hard to hear, right? Yeah. Of course it's hard to hear. Yeah. You know why? Because we're used to a generation that we don't deserve pain. We don't deserve consequences for our sin. That's what Satan wants to brainwash you in. See that? So the great white throne judgment. That's why it's so important, friend, where you receive Jesus Christ for your salvation. God does not want you to burn in hell, neither do any of us. We want to see you get saved in Jesus Christ today. Alright, the next part over here is chapter 21. So in chapter 21, ah, I did all of this in blue, so there was a mess up over here. I apologize. So this one would have been point number, was it five or six? I don't know. Six. Thank you. So point number six, this would be talking about the millennium and eternity. Millennium and eternity. And that would cover from chapter 20 through 22. Chapter 21 through 22, 
talks about eternity, where we all live happily ever after, a new heaven, a new earth. And then if you compare that with other passages such as Isaiah and Jeremiah, what's going to happen is that those tribulation saints, they're going to populate and spread out. So we're going to inhabit, not, we're not just going to rule on the earth or in heaven, we're going to rule throughout the whole universe. So that's stuff where people has fantasized about sci-fi stuff, Star Wars, Blade Runner, etc. That becomes reality with God. And with God, these people are going to spread out all over, and you don't think that that's going to be cool? Amen. You think that heaven Amen. is boring? Amen. You think that, oh, I should waste my time building up riches Come in on. this world, Come on. getting my goals, my plans done on this earth? Too small, man. Yeah. Too yeah. small. Yeah. God says, Revelation chapter 21, a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. Yeah. That's everything out there. You're missing out. You're missing out. And then he gives a conclusion, and this is the verse that I want to read for tonight. Oh, yeah. One of the greatest prayers in your Bible, yeah. one of the greatest prayers in your Bible that you should memorize. You'll notice that verses 20 through 21, how everyone should conclude the John is amazed after seeing all of this. And I'm sure you were too, right? Yeah, amen. Seeing all of this, what does John want? Even so... Come, Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. You'll notice right here, even so, come, Lord Jesus. What does John want? John wants Jesus Christ to come down now. That way we can live happily ever after with you. Let the end begin, Lord. Let all of this happen quickly so that we can live happily ever after. Amen. That is the greatest prayer and conclusion in the book of Revelation. Amen. So you guys got, got an idea of what we're going to cover later on. And this specific verse by verse will cover more of the specifics why. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teachings were a blessing to the hearers. Uh, increased our knowledge of the scriptures. Give us an idea about the end times. For it is coming and Satan wants the church to be asleep. Help us to be aware so that we can be prepared and be able to be better stewards of the Word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works, 
In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.